to the stay home era in Denver, a citywide lockdown to slow the spread of COVID-19. The state letting local jurisdictions set the rules means that the advice changes when you cross the street. Let's talk about why we aren't saying how many people in Colorado have recovered from coronavirus. We'll hear an ER doc's eyewitness perspective, and we see signs that Coloradans are treating social distancing like their lives depend on it, because they do. From my home to yours, this is next. It's six o'clock. Do you know where your families are? In Denver and Boulder, you're asked to be at home. Stay home orders are now in place. You can still get groceries, go out for medical care and medication. You can leave to donate blood, which is very much needed. You can still go outside for exercise. Just do that social distancing thing. You can even go to liquor stores and pot shops because Denver proved yesterday there'd be riots if those closed. But Denver and Boulder have now moved from asking people to telling people to stay at home the rest of the time. Thank you. Perhaps nobody has actually said that to you directly. Thank you. You're watching from home, so either by order or by intelligence, you are social distancing, and your neighbors appreciate it. For some, staying home for a while might seem like a vacation. I would guess for many more than that, staying home is an inconvenience. And for perhaps still more, staying home for an extended period of time is a significant hardship. You're wondering when life, when work, when your paycheck is going to return to normal. You're wondering perhaps when Congress will stop the same old squabbling and rush relief out to folks who are waiting for a paycheck. There's only so much that you and I can do about that here tonight, but I did want to start by saying thank you for the sacrifice that you are making to protect our at-risk neighbors. Five o'clock in Denver, the order took effect. We saw Denver police out in Washington Park just kind of keeping an eye on things. It didn't look like they were telling people to go home or giving anybody a hard time. Speaking of, of making space for folks, so Denver Safe Streets Advocates and a city councilman are asking the mayor to close down some streets near parks to give people more space to walk and run without being right on top of each other. Councilman Chris Hines noted today that a third of Denver sidewalks are narrower than four feet, and the Denver Streets Partnership asked for street closures specifically near City Park and near Cheeseman. So now Denver hoped to lead neighboring municipalities into similar stay home orders, but Aurora's Mayor Mike Kaufman says it's not his call. He tweeted that it would be up to the Tri County Health Department to decide for Aurora and Littleton and Inglewood. No statewide directive from Governor Polis means that cities and counties can each take their own approach, and Arvada is proudly proclaiming itself open for business. City Councilman John Marriott said council did not pass a stay at home order last night. Encourage people to get out there and spend money. Cannot even imagine working in a hospital ER right now. The waves are beginning to come in, and you have no idea when the big one is coming or how large it will be. An ER doctor spoke with our Chris Vanderveen today. He is beginning to see sick patients, and he is also rationing the protective equipment that keeps him from becoming a patient himself. What is life like for an ER doctor right now? It changes daily. Uh, I think every single day we come to work, there's something new as far as uh, testing goes, uh, what supplies are high or low. Are you having to, to reuse equipment, one mask a day, that kind of thing? We're definitely seeing the one mask per shift um, push that's definitely happening. You know, as far as face, face guards, um, gowns, all of those things, you know, we're rationing. That's not ideal, obviously. It is definitely suboptimal. You know, in a perfect world, we'd all be wearing N95s all the time, um, you know, to protect ourselves. If physicians and nurses go down in this critical time, we're going to have an even bigger problem outside of just ventilators. Are you getting some patients now that you believe have COVID? Yes. Uh, you know, I think we're, we're, we definitely have a lot of patients that we believe have COVID. The problem is the turnaround time on the test uh, is long, and so we may not know for, you know, five, six days. What are some of the classic things that you look for with a patient who is really sick? Patients are coming in with fevers and shortness of breath and cough, right? And so the, the biggest issue we, we then have is respiratory failure. So you can look and see what their oxygen level is, how they actually appear as far as their breathing, how they're feeling. When would you expect the surge to really get, get ramped up? 
So here in Colorado, I think we're definitely going to see this uh, get much worse in the next one to two weeks. I think we're going to have uh, a large number of sick uh, patients with COVID. Uh, but this is going to continue on through at least June. At least June. Hospitals in Colorado's mountain towns are transferring patients down to the front range because they have limited bed space and ventilators up there. The state health department tells us it's in contact with hospitals in Summit, Eagle, Gunnison and Pitkin counties constantly trying to gauge their capacity. Denver is suspending its homeless sweeps, those sidewalk cleanups where they push people out of the area where they're all kind of grouped together and living outdoors. The city says that it has secured a facility for people who are homeless and who are showing symptoms of COVID-19. They can also be referred to a facility by a healthcare worker if they don't need to be at a hospital, but they do need to be in isolation. Colorado's confirmed number of COVID-19 cases are creeping up on a thousand, but we have known for weeks now that there are likely thousands upon thousands of silent cases in our communities. The official numbers as they stand now are 912 confirmed cases across 35 uh, counties. That is up from 720 positive cases on Sunday. 11 Coloradans have now died. 84 have been hospitalized and 7,700 people have been tested. Every single day, some of you ask me why we don't report the number of Coloradans who have recovered from COVID-19. And the simple answer to that question is, we don't have that number. We directly asked the state health department about that today, and they said that they have no plans to release that number soon in their tallies. They did tell us that they would look at some other states that are reporting that number to try and figure out how they're calculating it. Here's one thing, though, to remember. Because we know the vast majority of people who get COVID-19 will not have to go to the hospital, and because we don't have widespread testing, there is not going to be a reliable number about that majority of people who contract the virus and then recover. The COVID-19 outbreak might have solved RTD's biggest problem while it creates some other ones. As RTD's board considers cutbacks tonight due to the, the long-term staffing shortage, in the immediate term, their ridership has plummeted. Our Steve Steger looks at RTD's complicated situation. The Bellevue Light Rail Station was something of a ghost town Tuesday afternoon, emblematic of COVID-19's impact on Denver's transit agency. A recent report sent to board members says ridership is down 70% since COVID-19 came to Colorado. We expected it. It was no surprise to board member Natalie Menton that RTD wants to temporarily cut back on what it offers. So I think this is justified. We need to do it. The plan the board will discuss tonight cuts service completely on two light rail lines, the F line from Ridgegate Parkway to downtown and the C line from Littleton to Union Station. All the other light rail lines would shift to Sunday service levels every day. Some bus lines would be cut. The others would shift to Saturday service levels every day. That means about a 40% reduction from what our current service levels are. But so RTD spokeswoman Pauletta Tanella says the agency's troubles prior to COVID-19 might actually help. It is our intent to maintain our workforce. RTD already has a shortage of bus and light rail operators. They're short about 100. This is going to be reducing in it so much of perhaps we'll be taking down the help wanted ad. The proposed cuts would eliminate the need for 300 operators. Since they're already short 100, Tanella says the other 200 would be shifted to fill in for sick drivers and get the opportunity for refresher training, eliminating the need for layoffs during this tough time. If we were fully staffed, it would be a much more difficult situation. If approved, these COVID-19 cuts would be effective April 19th through September 20th, though RTD could choose to put some of these routes back into normal service on a case-by-case -case basis before then. In the Denver Tech Center, I'm Steve Steger for Next. Is that this situation presents an opportunity in a way for RTD because now they are getting some real information about precisely where and when people want to go during a crisis situation so they can use that for prioritization in the future. Lost in the news this week was Colorado dropping the death penalty and clearing three men off death row. I'm disappointed. 
I'm disgusted. And symbols of hope, normally reserved for the holidays, are lighting up across our state. Next. Any other time but now, Colorado's decision to eliminate the death penalty would be something we'd be discussing at length here. Democratic Governor Jared Polis signed that bill yesterday. It was somewhat missed in all the talk about COVID-19. We did not want to miss the opportunity to talk with a family directly impacted by the governor's other decision to commute the sentences of the three men on Colorado's death row into life without the possibility of parole. Our Marshal Zellinger talked with that family today. We're mourning today because justice has been hijacked. It's been 15 years since Maisha Fields lost her brother Javad, who was murdered along with his fiance Vivian Wolf just before he was to testify as a witness in another murder. I believe that Javad and Vivian are turning in their graves. Maisha and her mom, Democratic Senator Rhonda Fields, knew this day was coming when Governor Jared Polis would sign the bill signaling the death of the death penalty in Colorado. I had no clue it was all going to be with one one pen stroke that he would repeal and then commute. Separately, Polis also commuted the sentence of the three inmates on Colorado's death row, the killer from the Aurora Chuck E. Cheese murders in 1993, and the two involved in the killings of Fields and Wolf. In his commutation of those two, Polis wrote, I hope they will find some comfort in knowing that a final decision has been made regarding the offender's sentence. I also hope that the victims find some peace and will finally be freed from the public attention that has forced them to relive this personal tragedy over and over. Does it give me peace? No, my heart will always be empty. 
and his decision hasn't given me any more peace than I had yesterday. Interestingly, the repeal of the death penalty still allows district attorneys to seek death in cases they charge through June 30th, like in Arapahoe County and the suspect in the 1984 hammer killings of the Bennett family. I take the legislature at their word. They went out of their way to say that in no way should this law be interpreted as impacting any existing murder or death penalty cases. You already know what's going to happen. The governor has already identified his values, what's important, and what he thinks about our, ju our justice system. And he's just going to commute it. District Attorney George Brockler pointed out state law that says that a commutation request needs to be made by the inmate. And because those two killers in the Fields case are still going through their appeals, a commutation request hasn't been made yet because they're still going through the court process. I've reached out to the attorney general, Kyle, to find out if there's even a mechanism that anyone could challenge the governor's commutations as illegal. I'm waiting to hear the answer still. All right. And meanwhile, Colorado has uh, not one but two, I believe, death penalty prosecutions, which are continuing right now, even though we know nobody's going to be put to death in the future. And the question would be, would the sentence happen if they're convicted and sentenced? Would that happen with Polis still in office? Would another governor have a different opinion? That could uh, change just depending on the timeline. Sure. All right. And on a much lighter note, Marshall, it's good to see you. And that Emmy in the background is very shiny. Congratulations to you. <laughs> Beautiful spring day in Colorado, but up high, it definitely looks like winter. There's still a lot of snow up there, but it looks like a picture postcard for those traveling I-70 today. Temperatures in the 60s for the city, about 10 degrees above average, but look at the numbers in southern Colorado, some 70s on the map. We're going to do this all over again tomorrow. High pressure is anchored over the area. The flow around it is clockwise, so even the moisture from this incoming system approaching Colorado will be pushed northward. There'll be a few high clouds and maybe a few light snow showers over the northern mountains like Steamboat, Craig, Meeker, Maybell, but lower elevations will be mild and dry tonight, tomorrow and Thursday. Things start to change for us on Thursday as that California storm moves in and rain and snow are part of the forecast for Denver on Friday. Fair skies and 37 tonight, sunshine tomorrow, quick warm up. Our high temperature tomorrow will be in the mid 60s. A nice toasty day ahead of some mountain snow on Thursday and rain snow mix here on Friday, the coldest day of the week. Temperatures soar heading into the weekend. We're back close to 70 on Tuesday. A lot of you sharing some wonderful pictures of the great outdoors. This would be ice fishing <laughs> or social distancing, Kyle, as you might see. You'd think everyone would appreciate grocery store workers these days. Next viewers tell us, sadly, that's not the case. And signs of inspiration and guidance are popping up across Colorado. I want to know what you've seen. Next.
Our nightly round of applause for the people keeping Colorado running goes to grocery store employees. Colorado appreciates you. A viewer named Izzy reached out to us on Twitter. Both of her kids work at grocery stores, minimum wage type stuff. And she says these days they're getting yelled at by customers, usually over store policies they have no control over. And she just asked the people think of their own children before getting frustrated with hers. Izzy, I got to tell you, there's so much love out there for grocery workers right now, even if it doesn't always seem that way. Heather wrote in with her appreciation and a plea for people to be kind. They're doing their best. Marissa and Ellie were among those who wrote into us with similar notes of thanks. All right. Who wants to be next? I will share your appreciation for the people who are keeping Colorado afloat right now. Text your thoughts to me and I'll share them statewide. Text 303-871-1491. You see communities across Colorado trying to maintain a sense of normalcy. Well, I'll tell you what, this is not normal and that is exactly the point. It's the cross that overlooks Glenwood Springs and it is lit up like it is for special events and holidays. The group that takes care of the cross met last week. They got some requests from community members to turn it on, and they've decided to leave it lit through Easter. You know, the star above Boulder is shining right now. Castle Rock's famous star is lit as well. I want to know what you're seeing in your community or your neighborhood, a sign of something special that we're in it together. Shoot me an email next at 9news.com or get my attention anytime with the hashtag HeyNext. We return with a sign that a grandmother woke up to this morning. That and your feedback next. It's a sign that celebrations are briefly changing, not going away. Peggy Hester emailed me today, so thrilled to tell me about the surprise that was waiting in her window from her grandkids on her birthday. That is so cool. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I slept in. Oh, doesn't it look pretty? 
No, you know what, Peyton? Listen, it's your, it's your birthday. You're self-isolating at home. Sleep in as long as you want. And what wonderful grandkids that you have. I know it would have been so easy for them or for you to say, you know what, we can just get together for a moment and it's no big deal. But you and your grandkids and all the rest of us know it is not that easy. So thank you guys for modeling social distancing. You know, the governor suggested on Sunday that Coloradans might be able to, uh, to ease the load by jogging twice a week instead of four times a week. I'm really going to do my part and jog zero times a week. Uh, we have an anonymous friend who writes in tonight to say you really enjoy reporting on misery. No, I absolutely do not, but we will look for things to smile and laugh about here every day. And Greg says, don't care about the stay home order compared to the flu, no one is dying. Greg, think about it like this. It's like points in a basketball game. You wouldn't compare one team's first quarter points to fourth quarter points. And the points aren't good. It means our neighbors will be lost. Be smart, my friend.